Okay, we're good. Uh, so we're gonna be doing intellectual property, but we're lawyers, we love disclaimers, so here's a few things. We are a lawyer, or we are lawyers, not a lawyer, but we're not your lawyers. Um, so anything that we say in here should be considered educational purposes, it's not legal advice. Um, if you need legal advice, you should consult attorneys. We just don't want you running out of here going, my lawyer said, no, we didn't, okay? So that's what the rest of this slide is. Not that you really care, but there you go. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Tom. He's going to talk about patents. Cool. Um, just hit the enter key and you'll be ready to roll. Yeah. So I'll just like further my introduction a little bit because it's pertinent to like if you needed to work with a patent attorney or someone that does patent uh, preparation and prosecution like I do. Prosecution, by the way, is just a fancy word for the examination process, the negotiation with the patent office. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade and most... Uh, uh, most patent attorneys will have, or all will have a hard science degree, and you should make sure or try to align whatever you have going on with whoever you hire. So if you're in the computer science industry, you want someone that has experience working on computer science stuff and so on and so forth. So anyway, so with my background, I work on basically everything other than biotech and pharma. So I'll just throw that in there. So what are patents? There are basically three main types of patents. I'm gonna cover them all pretty quickly here. Um, utility patents, design patents, and plant patents. Utility patents are the ones that you will have heard of when people normally talk about patents or inventions. They're usually speaking about utility, practice, uh, utility patents. They protect the function of how something works. This is the statute, this is language from the statute that shows you what utility patents can cover. Process machine, article manufacturer, composition of matter, or improvements thereof. Key on that improvements thereof, almost everything that's invented these days is an improvement over something that existed and that should be patentable, at least subject matter wise, as long as it meets the other requirements. I have a, another bullet point there that talks about patent eligible subject matter. This used to be a non-issue when filing patent applications. Um, back in 2013, there was a pretty horrific Supreme Court decision that came down that threw a monkey wrench into patent eligible subject matter. The old rule used to be that everything under the sun, as long as it wasn't, naturally occurring, a natural phenomenon, a mathematical formula, as long as it was man-made in some aspect, it was subject to patentability. Um, now, there's this whole concept of, is it an abstract idea? And a lot of software was characterized and has been characterized as abstract ideas. If you're in the realm of you're working on software and you're in a financial space, like working on financial transactions or something similar, or organizing human activities, I know that's vague, um, then you may have an issue with subject matter eligibility. So you should make sure that whoever you talk to has experience with those types of issues because they may arise in the future. The law has gotten better, I should say, since 2013, but it's not perfect yet. It's not even close. Um, the other requirements, this, this is the subject matter. These are the main requirements. You need to be new, useful, and non-obvious in order to get a patent. Useful is easy, almost everything's useful. Uh, new is also kind of easy. It's as long as you're a little bit different than whatever existed before you filed your patent application, you're probably new. The kicker and where most patent applications get stuck in the patent office is over non-obviousness. You need to be non-obvious over whatever existed previously. That's a very subjective standard. It's almost whatever an examiner thinks it is. Uh, they could say, oh, you're really close to this prior art reference, but you have a subtle difference. And I think that subtle difference is obvious. Um, or what they can do, and this is the more common type of rejection you'll see in a patent office, is they'll say, your invention is a combination of these two or three elements. I can't find all of those elements in one prior art reference, but I can find them in a bunch of different ones. And I think it would be obvious to combine those things together. And so the moral of the story is, is patent applications are better when they're detailed, um, have a ton of information in there, have uh, statements that talk about in very legalese ways uh, of like how you solve problems, advancements, improvements, things that um, can be useful for examination processes if you get caught up in this obviousness world where you can argue with an examiner and say, well, look at all of these special things that my invention does. None of the prior art teaches that. So anyway, um, this is another very important bullet point is there's no requirement to physically reduce your invention to practice. You need to be able to describe your invention such that someone with an ordinary level skill in that art field would be able to make and use your invention based on your disclosure, but you don't have to actually create it yourself. Sometimes 
your resources are scarce and you cannot create it yourself, or you've thought of a really big idea for maybe like nuclear power plants or something. You're not working in a nuclear power plant, but you have this idea, maybe you're a scientist, you're not gonna build a nuclear power plant to prove your concept, you just need to be able to do it on paper so that someone that did have those resources would be able to do it. This is a newer requirement, newer as in like in the last century. You used to actually have to submit patent models to the office. If you ever go to the US Patent Office in Alexandria, they have some of those cool old uh, patent models. I, I suggest checking that out at the museum. And this is uh, the term for patents about 20 years from filing. It's, there are factors that can extend that a little bit or shorten that a little bit. So if it's important to you to know exactly when a patent expires, which it may be if it's your patent or maybe if it's a competitor's patent, that you need to know, okay, when can I start doing this? Because the patent looks like it's expired. You should probably ask a professional because it's a little hard for a lay person to figure it out on their own. Uh, this. You just hit enter. There we go. All right, next one, design patents. I'll cover this quickly. They really just protect the ornamental design for an article of manufacture, which just means the way it looks, the coolness factor. Usually these are for tangible items. Like if you're selling a rubber ducky and you got a cool look for your rubber ducky, you may want to file a design patent on that. It's just going to protect the look, not at all the function. In the software space, you can do it for like graphical user interfaces or things like that. Um, less, you see those less and less though because they change so often over time and so there's really no point of protecting something that's old. Um, the requirements are basically the same as for utility patents. I will say these are usually much easier to get because they're pretty narrow in scope of protection which also means they're kind of viewed narrowly over the prior art. If you have a subtle change, yours looks slightly different than the prior art, you probably are okay to get a design patent. And there's no protection for purely functional features. That's, a lot of lawyers get tripped up on that and won't file design patents if it's a functional feature of an article of manufacture. My kind of rule of thumb, and this is very loose, is that if it could look a different way, you probably could get a design patent on it, even if it performs a function. Um, the term for design patents is different than utility patents. These are easy to figure out. It's 15 years from grant always, unless it's a very old one in which it would be expired anyway. Um, so 15 years from whatever date you see the grant date is, is when a design patent expires. You don't have to pay maintenance fees on design patents. So once you do them, they're one and done, and uh, you're good to go for 15 years without doing anything extra. Plant patents, I don't really work in this space. I have filed them out of necessity for clients, very reluctantly but I am not a botanist, I am not even a biologist, I know nothing about this, but I have done it. It's, it's, so if you ever create a new form of plant, uh, asexually created uh, reproduced plant, just not naturally occurring, you've spliced something together, create a new plant, you can get a patent on it. And, and like design patents, the term is 15 years from grant. You do see a lot of these more and more lately with the cannabis industry, although it's a little bit of a polarizing topic because there's like kind of a weird issue with prior art that was criminal, um, but that did exist. Um, but anyway, so if you're in the cannabis space, um, you should know about this and your patent attorney should hopefully have some experience in that area. Uh, so anyway, there's different flavors of patent applications as well as different flavors of patents that I covered. These are really for the utility patents that I talked about because again, that's like the main form of patents and the one that's most common and honestly probably the most valuable form of patents. So you got your provisional patent applications, non-provisionals, PCT applications, and continuing applications. I'll cover each of these briefly. You hear this a lot, provisional patent applications. If you're watching Shark Tank, the first question the sharks usually ask for anyone in the in a technology space is, do you have any patents? And the answer you often hear is, I have a provisional patent. That, to me, makes my skin crawl um, because there's no such thing as a provisional patent. It's a patent application that can eventually mature into a patent if you filed one of these, the non-provisional patent applications. Provisional patent applications on their own are not examined. They never issue into a patent. It's the non-provisionals that claim priority to a provisional that can. There are no formal requirements for provisional patent applications. There are a ton for non-provisional patent applications. Why would you file a provisional? Is because it gets you a filing date. And the filing date is important because that's the date in which the patent office will measure prior art against you. Everything that existed before you filed a patent application is prior art, and anything that exists after that is not prior art. So sometimes it's a rush to the patent office to try to file something. 
sometimes you don't want to put together all the formalities and expense of a non-provisional application. And for that, a provisional is great. It lasts for one year in which you can claim priority to it by filing a non-provisional patent application. My rule of thumb with provisionals is that they need to disclose the invention fully. Yes, they can be sloppy. Yes, they can lack formalities, but they need to fully disclose the invention. If you just take a bunch of presentation materials, slap a cover sheet on it and file it in the patent office, that probably doesn't teach the invention such that someone else of an ordinary skill in that field can make and use the invention. And therefore your provisional filing date is worthless. So your race to the office to get that filing date can be completely meaningless. So they should be thorough is my personal rule of thumb of provisionals. PCT applications is a form of a non-provisional. Patents are territorial, so a US patent only protects here in the US. So in order to protect uh, worldwide, or at least give yourself the potential to protect worldwide, you can file what's known as a PCT application that stands for Patent Cooperation Treaty. There's over 150 industrialized nations that participate in this treaty, basically everywhere you'd ever want to consider filing a patent. The only notable exception is Taiwan, and I really wouldn't recommend filing there now, given their kind of weird and unfortunate geopolitical circumstance. But anyway, so basically every country, you file one patent application, and then within 30 months of your earliest filing date, you need to make a decision about where you want to enter the national phase for that PCT application. So it's one application with an expensive filing fee that you pay, but you get to kick the can down the road for 30 months to make the much more expensive filing decision of, I wanna file a US patent, I wanna file a European patent, I wanna file an Australian patent, China, wherever. But that can get very expensive very fast. If you use a PCT, you're filing one application, 30 months later, that same application can mature into a patent application in whatever participating jurisdiction, but you need to pay their filing fees, you need to go through examination, you need to hire foreign counsel to prosecute those. I quarterback those efforts, but I can't prosecute a European patent because I'm not a European patent attorney. I cannot do an Australian patent because I'm not an Australian patent attorney. I'm only here in the US. Uh, and then continuing applications is, if you're an app patent application, patent applications often have more than one invention baked into them, and there's a way to daisy chain your patent applications through what's called a continuing application, which just means same specification in your original application, same drawings, but you're claiming a different invention that's included in it. It's a useful tool and they're highly valuable. All right, I'm gonna fly through the next ones because I'm leaving hardly a lot of time. So if you have an idea, what do you do? All right, I'm just gonna go through these quick. Keep it a secret. Anything you do that's a public disclosure, which is way broader than you would expect the definition of a public disclosure to be, can be detrimental to your future patent rights. So again, that race to the patent office to file maybe a provisional application can become key so you don't have to keep it as secret. Maybe you've got a little bit, uh, you got a presentation coming up. I have one of these for a client next week where we need to file a provisional application because they're about to disclose the invention and they're heeding my advice to keep it secret until they've filed something. Um, should contact a patent attorney or patent agent. This is unfortunate and it's very self-serving for me to say. It's a, such a complicated process pro se applications die in the patent office. And the patent office has a lot of resources that encourage pro se filers, and they're really great resources too. I, I, I can't lie about that. And I enjoy their efforts to promote this, but there are so many pitfalls that even I fall into after 17 years of experience in this area that you really just need a professional to help you out with this process, in my humble opinion. Um, Always want to consider conducting a patentability search just so you know the scope of the prior art that's out there. I say here, don't really do it yourself. I really wouldn't recommend doing searches yourself either unless it's just very like preliminary and broad because you want to keep detailed notes. The patent office, the US patent office has stringent requirements about submitting known material prior art to it that can invalidate your whole patent procedure if you don't. So if you are doing patent searching on your own, you need to keep very detailed notes of what you find and then give that to your patent attorney for submitting to the US Patent Office. Um, and then provisional applications can be really helpful because they're cheaper and easier to prepare than non-provisional. So I would take advantage of that. Um, I'm just really gonna blow through this, but like patents are super valuable because you can create a limited monop monopoly over your invention by preventing others from making, using, selling, and importing your invention in whatever territory you have the patent over, say the US patent, that can be insanely val valuable. 20 years is, a, is an eternity in the business world. So to have a monopoly over something that's valuable is, is fantastic. 
Um, you can license or sell a patent just like you could any other piece of property. They're really transferable. You can create all types of cave caveats. Yes? So when you were talking about design patents, I was wondering sure. why not just get a copyright? Is this the reason because the patent allows you to license it to generate revenue, whereas you copyright your design, that doesn't really give you that ability to license it? So technically, they're different forms of protection, different scopes of protection. So they protect different things. So you're not supposed to have like the same form of protection via trade dress as you do via design patent because that could be a constitutional issue. That's like a little in the weeds nerdy stuff. So it's really just about like, you wanna go for the type of IP protection based on whatever you have. Like if it's a creative work, then you're in the copyright space. If it's a brand or logo type of thing, then you're in the trademark space. If it's an invention, then you're in the patent space. I know design patents get weird because it's about the look of something, but it's usually, again, about a tangible article where the only other form of protection would really be uh, like trade dress because it wouldn't even be, be copyright because copyright is more for like a unique work. You're not like usually selling a ton of those. So it's more design patents for like so the I rubber ducky. Technically, you could do both, but again, the scope would be different. Like you're, yeah. yeah, you're you're protecting like via patent. What you're protecting is like the actual shape, like picture the exterior like features that define that design. Whereas in copyrights, which I'll let Matt handle because I'm not okay. a copyright person. Yeah, Matt needs just 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so right. it's often a key factor for investors, both quality and quantity. I sit in a lot of investor meetings where they ask. Do you have patents? How many do you have? That frustrates me a little bit as a patent attorney because like people can juice the numbers in any way you want, but it's a question that's almost always asked in any investor meeting. And so just be prepared for it if, if you hear that, and especially if you're in a, a technology driven area. Um, pending patent applications, kind of going back to what I said about continuing applications, have a ton of value because you can shift the claims of those patent applications, not the specification, not the drawings, those are locked and are set in stone, but you can shift the claims to try to capture would-be infringers. So in a circumstance, you could file one patent application, get an issued patent, a competitor sees it, designs around the claims of that. But if you have a continuation pending, then you can shift your claims to try to capture that infringer. This is a game that every Fortune 500 company on earth plays with one another often, uh, and it can be fun. Uh, and then patent enforcement, clearly that, that's vital. That's how you uh, like utilize the, the patent. Um, but I will just say it's insanely expensive to enforce a patent. Um, so you will need help most likely doing that if you're ever in that circumstance. All right, I think that's it for me. Um, so uh, trademark, they act as a source identifier. It is a mental shortcut between a product and the source of that product. So if you go to the, you know, you go to the shoe store, you see a Nike swoosh, you have an idea of the quality of that product based upon the identity of the swoosh. That's how it works. It can be words, it can be images. You know the if you've ever watched ESPN, that da 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 da, that sound is trademark. Okay. If you listen to ACAST podcasts, they have that sound in there. That's trademark. You can trademark a sound, you can trademark a smell, taglines, images, logos, business names, things like that. So all kinds of things. The purpose is to protect your brand identity. It is not because it's a unique thing like patents where it's brand new or it's, it's a unique configuration. It is about your brand, your identity. The lovely thing about trademarks is as long as you are using it in commerce, it's good. The Coca-Cola trademark has been around for more than 100 years. Kind of cool. Um, so as long as you keep using the trademark in, in, in business, it will be good. Now, you do have to maintain it. And every five to 10 years, there's some violent fees that you have to pay the government another 500 and some odd dollars right now um, to keep the trademark renewed. And you just have to show that you're using it in commerce. So I'll tell you a story. When I was a kid, I went to, um, there was a soccer team for the old NASL down in Tampa called Tampa Bay Rowdies. 
Well, the NASL folded in the early 80s, and the Rowdies folded as well. Well, they're back now, and they have the same logo because some guy kept selling t-shirts. And as long as he was selling the, trying to sell the t-shirts, whether he sold one or not was irrelevant. Trying to sell them, he maintained the trademark. And he still owned the trademark. And the club had to buy the trademark off of him. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, the big thing is um, when you file a trademark application, it cannot be confusingly similar. Um, the standard that the, the government uses is called likelihood of confusion. And that kind of like patent stuff is as much an art as it is a science. Some things are going to be pretty easy. There was a case involving Victoria's Secret where a competitor tried to have Victor's Secret um, selling lingerie and you know the trademark office said no. Um, and then it went to court, which is how we found out about that. So that's the standard. So whatever brand that you put together, you need to do some research in advance. Um, it's not as detailed because you don't have to submit your research to the, to the trademark office, but um, you need to do a, a search, do a trademark clearance search. Um, the trademark database is public. You can just go to the PTO website, look up the trademark database, and you can do a search. They just redid their search engine, and it's much better than it used to be, um, which is kind of nice. You don't have to click through a thousand things to look at the trademark, but you can see that. Um, okay. The PTO process is actually relatively straightforward to file a trademark application. You need a whole bunch of information about who's going to own it, then you have to describe it, then you have to say what are the goods and services that are going to be covered. That's the important part. The goods and services that are covered will, will that will one, determine how much money you have to pay for your filing fees, but it also, you can have similar trademarks but if they're on vastly different goods and services, um, then you may be able to get a successful trademark, even if it looks the same as somebody else, because the goods and services are in radically different fields. Um, if somebody wanted to have, well, yeah, if somebody wanted to put like, you know, rocket technology, you know, under, you know, the Nike brand, they probably would be able to because a reasonable consumer is not going to go, oh, well, Nike, the athletic shoe and apparel company, is now building rockets. They, most people would understand that that's not the same. So you get that sort of differences. Um, the goods and services are classified into an, under an international treaty, which is kind of fun. Um, and so the trademark that you register here in the United States, if you wanted to register it in another country, like patents, it's just the United States covered as the United States, but if you wanted to register in another country, you would be using the same categories of classes because it's an international, like 170 some odd countries are part of the trademark. Okay. Um, the thing that sucks right now is it used to be about six months to process a trademark application. It's now running about 10 months before the, the trademark office actually looks at it. And then you're still looking at two or three months at best um, to get a process. So it may take up to a year. Now, people ask me this. There is a difference. Everybody's seen the little circle R? That's a registered trademark. You can only use the little circle R if you are registered with the PTO. If you're not, you can use the little TM or SM, SM stands for service mark, TM for trademark. You can start asserting a trademark using that little TM. If it's a common law assertion, you could sue somebody for infringement. It's just not gonna be, it's, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult. All right, uh, benefits. You get the exclusive use of it forever as long as you are using as long as you're using it comes, it's a forever thing. Okay? Um, the trademark office does not police trademarks. That's not their job. Now, if somebody submits an application, they will say, no, you can't. Anybody who files after you, they will say, no, you can't have that because it's confusing and similar. But you have to do your own policing for anybody who doesn't register. Because there's no requirement to register a trademark. 
So if you don't register the trademark, it's up to you. Um, so you have to sort of police it on your own. Um, there are services that, that out there that will run both a trademark database search um, or, um, and then they'll do a, like a, a Google search, a worldwide web search, so that you can report. You can set up your own, um, you know, but others will do it for, for a service. The, the, probably the most beneficial thing in terms of a trademark, you can assign a trademark. So if you sell your business or something like that, you can assign a trademark. Or if, some, or if you're selling a segment of your business. But most people will build their business using a trademark with brand partnerships. Um, so let's say we wanted to have a brand partnership between Bass Patent Law and Cohort Credit Foundation. They could share their trademarks and you authorize the use of it. And that's how you can build your brand. That's usually the best way of doing it. Um, the federal, federal law, the trademark law, it's called the Lanham Act, is what it's called. Um, has a whole series of protections about infringement. Um, one of the nice things is you just have to prove infringement. You don't have to prove damages. Um, but one of the cool things about infringement, if it's goods, like physical goods, you can either have those physical goods destroyed, which is kind of an interesting order to see, you know, a judge saying to a company, you infringed, all of those products must be destroyed now. Um, Usually, there's, there's monetary damages and things like that, um, but yeah, that's one of the cool things. Um, you can also have your products and your trademarks registered with Customs and Border Patrol, who will then make sure that there's no infringing products coming from overseas into, uh, into the U.S., which is kind of fun. After five years of registration, so you do your first five years, okay, if nobody challenges that, you have the presumption of validity and exclusivity, and it's super hard to overcome that. Like, essentially, you would have to prove probably fraud. Um, and even then, you might not get it. So, you know, build your brand, keep maintaining it for the first five years, then you have the legal presumption of, of ownership that can't be overcome. Somebody can't come in later and say, oh, well, I didn't know about it, but I've been using that mark for six or seven years and they're infringing on No. After five years, you are presumed to be the owner of that trademark. So that's about, probably about the best benefit. All right, copyrights. <coughs> Here's the thing that most people get, okay? It's a creative work that's being protected. Songs, books, writing of any purpose, websites, computer programs. You can copyright a computer program. Um, Anything that you can put down into a fixed medium of expression is subject to copyright. But it is the expression of the idea, not the idea itself. This makes sense if you walk into a bookstore. You go into the bookstore, you go to like the self-help section, and there's a hundred books about how to be a better person. And they say a lot of the same things. That's perfectly fine. It's the expression, it's the combination of words the combination of musical notes, the combination of computer code, the combination of elements and 3D things, that's what's being protected, okay? It is, there's been a few changes, but the copyright itself is valid for the life of the creator. They refer to author as everybody who's a creator. Everybody who's a creator is considered an author under the, the Copyright Act. Life of the author plus 70 years. Uh, if you remember, I don't know, two years ago, a year and a half, two years ago, all copyrights expire on January 1 of each year. So the Anne Frank, the diary of Anne Frank, the cop, because she passed away, you know, if you've ever read it, you know when she died. Um, the life of the author is, the 70 years had expired, and then there was this beef about whether or not editorial changes that her uncle or somebody had made extended it and all this other stuff. So you, you get that a lot. Um, so it's life of the author plus seven years um, or 95 years from publication if you're a corporation or 120 years, which is why you're seeing changes to Mickey Mouse. Okay, because Mickey Mouse, the, the original Mickey Mouse is now entering the public domain. All right. Um, copyright uh, applies from the creation, the moment you create it. You can assert the copyright. 
You don't have to register the copyright to assert it. That's a change in the law. Um, a few years ago, they said you can assert the copyright without having to register it. Um, but if you register it, you have these rights. Okay, the right to reproduce the work, the right to distribute the work, create derivative works, we'll come to that in a second, perform the work or display the work. So these things right here, even though they aren't registered with the Copyright Office, they are copyrighted. Sort of. Okay? The artists here have the absolute right to, dis to, to display them. That's their right. Um, musicians, you know, actors and things like that, their performance is copyrightable. I mean, it can be registered. So all those Hollywood movies and TV shows that you see, all of those actors are independent contractors. Those independent contractors give up their right to their performance to the, the copyright holder, which would be the studio. Um, so those things are manageable. And you can slice and dice these. That's the nice thing. You can give somebody else, you can give one person the right to reproduce it and distribute it, but you can withhold the rights in other ways. So people may have seen Creative Commons licenses and stuff like that. Creative Commons is a simplified version under U.S. patent and uh, or under U.S. copyright and other copyright law um, that says you can use this, to, you can share it, you can use it for whatever purpose you want, you just got to get credit. That's one of the reservations that you can give in the copyright. Um, prepare derivative works. If you ever sort of watch this, you know, Hollywood is a, is a good example. There's a book, and then somebody sells the rights to make the movie of the book for a short period of time. That's a derivative work. You're changing the format of the work to a certain extent, and that's a derivative work, and that license is given, okay? It is the licensing of, of your copyrights that makes you money, the ability to use it. If you write a course, um, if Tom and I wanted to copyright this presentation, we could then give people the right to sell it, okay? Not, so, don't worry. Um, uh, but you, 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 we would be able to control whether or not somebody could watch it. Um, you know, you watch sporting sporting events and stuff like that. They'll have this this cop this telecast is copyrighted by the National Football League. Blah, blah 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 blah. That's what they're doing. You can go to a bar and watch the game, but the bar can't charge money for you to go and watch the game. They just charge you money for the drinks. Okay. Finally, compared to Patents, which are brutally expensive, and trademarks, which are only kind of expensive, registering and copyright is pretty cheap. It ranges from about $50 to $55, $55 up to about, I think it's like four or $500 if you're registering like architectural plans for a ship. Okay, so it ranges, but it's relatively cheap. You can register your copyright on your own. Okay, um, it's actually a relatively easy to use portal, um, so you can do it. You can batch items together, so if you're a photographer, I think it's up to 75 photographs per application that you can submit. Um, right now it takes eight to 10 months or so for the copyright to process the registrations. You know, unless you have obviously plagiarized something or you are copying like federal documents and things like that, you're going to get the copyright, it just takes a while to process it. You can expedite it if you, you've got to sue somebody on it. Um, then you have to pay like 800 bucks and it takes about two weeks. Um, there's no re renewal or filing fees. All right. The cool part about it is if you have a register, so we take this painting and we register it with the copyright office. If somebody took this painting and started using it willfully with the knowledge that it was copyrighted, you can get up to $150,000 in statutory damages per infringement, which is a lot, okay? Let's say somebody published a book that had this painting in it and they sold 250,000 copies. That's $150,000 times 250,000, okay? But that's super willful infringement. You can have other things. So you can get statutory damage. Um, a copyright license is easy to create, to transfer, to sell, to grant, things like that. Creative Commons is super useful. Um, so, yeah. You can sell some rights and reserve others, all this other stuff. 
If you are an employee um, or you're an independent contractor, your work may belong to your employer. I would, I would make work made for hire, which I think applies in patent as well. Yes, work, so. work made for hire? Yeah, well, yeah. It, it has to be expressly in yeah. The, yeah. the work for hire agreement. But yeah. yeah. So, but if, like, if you're a newspaper, if you're a like a newspaper reporter, everything you write for the newspaper, it doesn't even have you don't even have to say that it is a work made for hire in some sort of contract. Most do, but you don't have to. And that becomes part of it. All right. Um, we're actually, I'm actually dealing with this. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act, you know, online platforms and things like that that are going on, you can have a situation where if your work is up on somebody's platform, you can send a takedown notice to the platform owner that says, that's my copyright, that's my material, that's my copyright. The platform is required to take it down until they can resolve if there's a dispute and things like that. So it's a beautiful self-help thing for online stuff. Um, <laughs> my daughter, my youngest daughter is a musician, and I videotaped her senior recital because she was going to be doing this piece that I absolutely love. And I got a takedown notice from Facebook that says, you can't do that because the music was copyrighted. And I'm like, yeah. So I still have the recording, I just can't put it up on Facebook. All right. All right. Trade seekers, real fast. Unlike any other form of IP that we've talked about, patents, trademarks, copyrights, you don't register a trademark, a trade secret. Okay? The whole purpose of the trade secret is the secret part, which is you're keeping it secret. Okay? There's a federal law called the Defend Trade Secrets Act. Um, there are some similar state laws that are around, but essentially for a trade secret to operate, the owner of the secret has to take reasonable steps to keep it secret, okay, i.e. you're not blabbing it to everybody, and the secret itself has to have some independent economic value. Independent is the important part. A lot of people say, well, my, I, don't want my, I don't want my employees to take my customer list because it's a trade secret. No, it's a proprietary information, it's confidential, but it's not a trade secret. The recipe for Coca-Cola, or the recipe for the pasta sauce that you happen to love, that's a trade secret, because the recipe has an independent economic value. It's also the way that you protect recipes, because you cannot copyright a recipe. Um, that's why all of the cookbooks have all that gobbledygook. Uh, I, I, this was my favorite meal as a child. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> they can copyright all of that gobbledygook. They can't copyright the recipe book or the recipe itself. So that's why recipe books have all of that crap that you that nobody ever reads. Let's be honest with you. I've, I've got a whole bunch of cookbooks. I've never read that crap. <laughs> Not once. And I love the online recipe things where it has a little button that says jump to recipe. Because I don't read all of that crap. I'm like, but that's so they can copy it. Alright. Trade secret can be anything in any format, recipe, process, um, even, even an item that is unique and can't really be reverse engineered, which is where trade secrets get some of its benefit. If you can't really reverse engineer it, that's great. Then you don't have to spend a whole lot of money with Tom to get it patented. Um, now, bear in mind there's a lot of very, very talented, very smart people out there who will probably reverse engineer it. Okay? My nephew has this weird ability to break down any recipe. Like he can go, oh, it's got this in it, it's got that. I'm like, how the hell do you taste that? He does. Um, so he has that ability. So, yeah. Uh, don't give them any recipes because you're screwed. Um, to protect your trade secrets, you're going to need NDAs, non-disclosure agreements with the employees, and anybody who's going to have access to it. Okay? Not every employee should have access to it. Right? That's one of those reasonable things. That, you know, if you're if you're sort of an inventor type person um, and you work at, at you know a large company, the the person who's on your computer help desk does not need to have access to that information. But if he knows it or she knows it, 
Are you really keeping it a secret? Okay. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, so trade secrets, the important part is keep it secret and make sure that it has independent economic value. If it gets disclosed, you're screwed. You can, you can sue, but it, and you can probably get some damages, but usually the person who's disclosed it is a former or current or former employee, and good luck in collecting on that judgment. I mean, you may have some serious economic damages and stuff like that, but your patent ability is now voided because there's been a public disclosure. Um, even if you didn't have anything to do with the public disclosure, so in patents, it's a little weird. Um, in the United States, we're actually pretty inventor friendly, where a public disclosure of an invention doesn't preclude your right to file a patent application until one year after that. It does not matter who made the public disclosure. Yeah, that's that's, that's like right. a lot of other jurisdictions around the world do not have such a grace period, and which is why I always say you want to file before you publicly disclose anything because you don't want to be like, okay, I'll just rely on US patent protection when maybe a year from now Europe will be a very important market for you. They're an absolute novelty jurisdiction, so any public disclosure of the invention will prevent you from filing in Europe if you haven't already filed. Yeah. So keep that stuff a secret, yes. Um, yeah. Um, trade secrets, in theory, you can monetize them by selling them to somebody else. Um, they may have some value, but you're gonna you better have an absolute crazy penalty driven non disclosure agreement to do that. Um, and generally, most of the NDAs out there, in my opinion, are not worth the paper that they're written on. So, if you are in sort of a negotiation about a trade secret, about disclosing it, speak to counsel so that you can draft a proper NDA. Otherwise, there's no point. All right? So that's it. Uh, it's kind of questions. Yeah. One thing I'll just add about the trade secret piece, because they're they're kind of like the alternative to patents. Because if you file a patent application, by definition, you have to publicly disclose, at least eventually, what the invention is. That's part of the public trade-off. The government says, if you're putting this out there for the world to see, for the world to add on, to build technology, to spur innovation, like you have to make it public. You have to teach the invention to your audience. Trade secret is the exact opposite of that. So usually, where you make that decision, do a trade secret or do a patent, is if it's reverse engineerable, as Matt said. Like if you can easily reverse engineer it just by taking it apart and figure out how it works, which most things you can, you probably want to go for a patent. Software-wise, if you, someone else, a skilled programmer, could make a software function as your software does, maybe not with the exact code, you probably want to file a patent application on it, even if you keep your code a trade secret. That's what many of the tech industries do, like your Googles and Apples of the world. Their code, their actual code is a trade secret. They don't copyright it because they don't want people to see it. It's a trade secret, but the functionality of that code is usually patented, or at least they'll try to patent it. With, with a copyright application, you don't have to submit every line of code, um, but you do have to submit a substantial amount of code, which is why a lot of computer code does not get submitted for copyright registration. You can still assert the copyright on it, uh, and if you probably look through whatever source code that you know the Google algorithm is on, it probably asserts the copyright somewhere in there in the notes, of, but they keep it secret. From fairly obvious reasons. All right, so here's our contact information. Uh, I have cards over here if you really want one. There's also some out there. Um, thanks to Julia Ainsley for 